Coming up next on the social hour, Twitter replaces Facebook as the place teens like the most, plus medium is open to all, and what's going on with Wikipedia? Oh, and does your phone need to be your nightstand lamp? All that and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash android. Bandwidth for the social hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is The Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 134, recorded Friday, October 25th, 2013. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash social hour. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash social hour. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website, portfolio, or online store. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code SOCIALHOUR10. And by Social Media Solutions from SAP. If you're a social media manager at a large enterprise, gain insight and engage in social media with Social Media Solutions from SAP to improve your customer service and support experience. Take a guided tour at sap.com slash twit. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Social Hour. For all of you joining us live, it is Friday afternoon, and here at Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California, I am Sarah Lane, and it's finally fall weather. Ah, uh, yeah, it's been fall here a lot. I'm Amber MacArthur. I'm here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It is definitely fall. The leaves have turned, and in fact, it's starting to get quite cool, so uh, fall is... Uh, uh, kind of disappearing very quickly, unfortunately. But uh, I do love that fall feeling, Sarah. It's very cozy. But when it gets into full-on winter, I'm not going to be so happy. I'm not going to lie. Well, luckily, you guys have, you do your, like, you fly south for a yes. little bit part of the winter. So it seems like as a person from a northern territory, you've got the whole thing figured out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Spend quite a bit of time down south. And uh, in January, I have a speaking gig in Palm Springs. So I'm excited about that. That's a great time to get away. Yeah, <laughs> January no can be cold. Yeah, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Sounds good. Yeah, I was, uh, I was driving home the other day from work and it was a little bit later than I usually go home. It was Monday and it kind of had that, like, it was kind of turning dusk. And it's like, oh, there's that feeling. I haven't felt this way for like a year. It's hard to put it into words it just feels like a certain time of year so, so it's, it's kind of holiday season feeling i don't know i love sure. it yeah you yeah. start smelling people's fire uh, not fires uh, chimneys <laughs> yes no i'm with you super cozy so uh we have a lot to talk about today uh one of the first things uh we wanted to talk about is a new study that has come out which has talked about a topic that we've mentioned many times on the social hour that teens are starting to move away from facebook this isn't anything new but it's interesting as far as the stats talking about how twitter is overtaking facebook as the most popular social network for teens according to uh the study that was done and and Instagram is close behind Facebook in the list of popularity. You know, I can't say I am surprised just because Twitter seems more, how, how do I even describe it? I don't want to say gimmicky because I don't, I don't believe that at all. It certainly had a lot of staying power for me, but it's sort of just more fun. You know, you've kind of got your Twitter lingo and everything's shorter and, um, it seems like something a teenager would like better. Also because I think there's still a big difference between something like Twitter where a lot of parents or older people might be like, ah, Twitter, I don't, who needs that? But mm -hmm. Facebook is sort of like fun for the whole family and there is a lot of emphasis on groups and sharing photos and photo albums from that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an everybody affair. And, you know, kids don't like that. It's like, yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the things I don't know if that happens to you, Sarah, but one of the things I find about Twitter is that over the years, it has trained me to want 
instant information, almost like real time information. And then all of a sudden I leave the Twitter environment and I head over to Facebook and then I find out that perhaps a good friend of mine or a cousin, they haven't updated in a week and the information feels old. So one of the things I like about Twitter is just the timeliness of it. And it's a it's an easier investment as far as your time because you just send out 140 characters or less. Whereas Facebook to me is starting to feel like Wow, you know, there's effort in posting. You've got to write more. You've got to post pictures. And as much as it's useful, I just, I like how current Twitter is. Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree with you. I'm actually, I mean, I think, I think the whole, when you put it into what do teens like? I mean, there's a part of me that thinks, well, teenagers just like new and cool. Um, mm-hmm. And Twitter is I, I, arguably very cool, but certainly not new. This has been around for a long time. It's not as if it's some sort of secret place that nobody knows about. I mean, everybody has a Twitter account. But there is still, yeah, there is that somehow cutting edge feeling that mm-hmm. Twitter has, at least for me. You know, I was um, I was out and about with friends last night and we were at, you know, like a silly music event. And it was one of those things where I had taken a picture and I wanted to share it on the internet. And it was like, do I post this to Facebook? No, it wouldn't, it would just sort of it confuse people. Yeah. Or do I post it on Twitter and it kind of works? It's and and again, we're obviously not the audience here. We're not teens, but it does seem like um, that 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 it would be Facebook wouldn't be like the cool place to hang out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it would be great too if we have any teens who listen to the show on a regular basis and uh, could let us know what they think, what they're using, because I think it, you're right. It is a totally different audience. I also think teens are so comfortable with messaging through all of the different tools they use, whether it's Snapchat or just messaging on Facebook, that they're just comfortable with this idea of just short snippets of text. So in that sense, Twitter works perfectly for them. Totally does. And, you know, Leo is always saying that his uh, his kids don't really like Twitter. They just use Instagram. And, in fact, they uh. sort of use it like they would use Twitter. It's just that everything always has a photo or now a, now a video accompanying it. And then, you know, you've got your little caption underneath and that sort of the self-expression thing. And there are so many sh- uh, closed accounts on Instagram, meaning private. So it's like whatever they're talking about... Um, you you know it's it's not it's not for parents or prime yeah. eyes so there's that no. too you're right. I mean, that kind of leads in nicely to our next story, because I know we don't talk a lot about Windows news on this show, but uh, as someone who does have a Windows device, I know one of the things that has always frustrated me is the fact that Instagram is not available on Windows. Well, based on this article on readwrite.com, it looks like Instagram is finally coming to Windows phone. So this is exciting for people out there who want to be able to use that platform. And, uh, you know, I think it's been a long time coming for Windows users. Yeah, we were um, we were talking about this on TNT earlier this week and and you know that the the story is well if Instagram comes to Windows Phone I believe Flipboard is has been announced as coming as well how does that change you know that what what we perceive the ecosystem is like um, and I think even if you don't use Instagram I mean even if it's like you, you could take it or leave it there is a perception that if something that's an, an incredibly popular uh, social network somehow isn't part of your OS. You're just doing something wrong. Um, yeah. So I think that you know, for for Microsoft, this is this is huge. Yeah, I don't know how much Instagram really benefits. I mean, it certainly benefits just by being on a variety of platforms. But it seems like it's much much bigger win for Windows Phone than it is for Instagram. Yeah, and I I do think that um, although there are great apps on uh, the Windows platform, I think that there is that need for those few few shining examples. And I I know you definitely touched on that, the idea that you are able to get, you know, some of the most popular apps out there. And I think now Instagram can be considered one of those top apps. So it's good news. Uh, Now, Sarah, this is an interesting story. I know you've talked before in the show about Medium, the Mm -hmm. blogging platform. And I don't use this very much, but I do see more and more people using it as a place to share content that they write, and this could be pretty exciting news for them. Yeah, so this is uh, this is Medium that you are alluding to. Medium is a it's a blogging platform that it's sort of got a lot of attention right out of the gate uh, because uh, it is Evan Williams, who is the co-founder of Twitter, uh, his project, along with some other Twitter alums, and but the thing about Medium that has been so interesting is that you have a lot of very high profile people writing sort of op-ed stuff on Medium where 
they already maybe have their own blog or there are other places that they could write some of the stuff. And so it's kind of turned into this place where interesting people are posting interesting things. And sometimes it's unclear to me, well, why did you choose Medium as a platform for this particular piece? But there's some very high quality content there. However, uh, some time ago when it initially launched, it was, it was uh, like a reservation uh, uh, invitation type of a thing. I had gotten one because of, you know somebody was able to invite me and I never really wrote anything and it just sort of sat there. Uh, but, uh, and then it was opened up to some other folks, but it still kind of turned into like a, well, who writes on Medium and are they getting paid and what does the business model look like? Now it is open to anybody. I mean, if you or me or anybody wants to, uh, to write a post on Medium and have it published, we can do that. Doesn't necessarily mean anyone's gonna read it. It's kind of just like another blogging platform, but it is very nice. Yeah, it's very slick. You know, it's really interesting. I was speaking at uh, an education conference yesterday and today, and yesterday there was someone at the conference who said something that I never really thought about, and it's about uh, the importance of text. And uh, his stance was a little bit different. I mean, probably going uh, against uh, the idea of medium, but he had said he thinks that we're somewhat arrogant about how text is the most important tool in our future, especially the future of a younger generation, and how really we should be turning and thinking much more about images and about video as a way of communicating. And there's just too much emphasis on the written word. I thought that was, was kind of a neat concept because I wonder with Medium, I mean, with so many image-based platforms out there, is Medium almost kind of behind the times in some ways? Yeah, you know, that's, that's an interesting concept also. And sometimes I think about this because you and I, Obviously, for a living, I mean, we do we do video-based content. I mean, we write as well, but I would say the bulk of what I what I do and share and 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 create is in the video format. And sometimes I I wonder, you know, why is it there's like, there'll be an article about you know some tech company, and it's like it gets so much attention. And why is why, why the disparity between the two? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's because video is a little bit more of a, I don't know, it's, a, it's an audio visual. You've kind of got, you can't sort of, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I guess you can multitask when watching video, maybe even more so than you can multitask when reading. But, uh, but yeah, I don't necessarily think that the, the, the text and the words are, are the most important part of sharing. And I wonder, yeah, what, where does Medium go? Do they, does it turn into something where if you were to go to medium.com, there'd be some curated list of, of really, really important uh, posts maybe that have happened over the course of the day or the week? The company already does that. I actually have a weekly email digest and I find some interesting content that way that the company just sort of sends out. But, but yeah, what, what does something like this evolve into? It almost makes me think that the reality is with, with something like Medium, it's not the technology that's important, but instead it's really the content. It's the people that they're able to attract to write on Medium. So they are really just another publishing outlet. They're not necessarily doing anything innovative with the content, but instead I know they've attracted people. I think Gary Vee uses it and it's about them being able to curate content that is of interest. So the technology, I mean, it's, it's not a big deal, right? I mean, it's a blogging platform, sure. but if they can get the, the right kind of people using it, then they're all of a sudden competing with the other services out there that are just serving up really great and interesting content. Totally. There's actually a, um, there's a parody Twitter account, of course, <laughs> uh, for course Medium, just because Medium has, there, there, is some, uh, there is some excellent content on Medium. And then there have been a few articles that they get a lot of attention because people are like, who are these people writing on Medium? Um, the Twitter account False Medium, at False Medium. Uh, is, 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 is good for a laugh. It's basically just fake articles that don't exist, but could be headlines of somebody who was writing something on, uh, on, on Medium. For example, the most recent, talking your office out of doing a lip dub. Hilarious. Yeah. I have not watched Breaking Bad, but The Wire is still better. Things that you, you know, wouldn't be too far-fetched uh, to, to, to read. I, I enjoyed, that, I enjoyed so that one. Funny. I've retweeted one or two. All right, so let's move on to, this is a really, really interesting article um, on technology review from MIT about, and it's a fascinating read. If you're interested in Wikipedia and how it, how it started and how it's evolved over the years, uh, we'll definitely have this um, article in our show notes. But the gist of it is that 
Wikipedia is going through a transformation, and it's not necessarily a good one. There are fewer editors working on Wikipedia overall. Of course, this is a it, Wikipedia is a community project. It's it's a not not for profit uh, uh, um, service, which where anybody you know as part of the community can contribute or edit a an article uh, that's on Wikipedia. And there are certainly high level people who have. Um, special rankings that have the power to uh, take text out or, or ban a user or, 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 or basically just oversee to make sure that the whole thing doesn't run rampant. But in general, you know, it's a community effort. The community that is considered an active member, meaning, you know, they've logged in and edited something within, you know, a, a, a recent amount of time, mm -hmm. has dwindled quite a bit by, um, by thousands, in fact. And there aren't really that many high-level editors. I think it's six, 600 and something. And uh, technology review from the data uh, of, of the people who are actually Wikipedia editors, 90% male, which, you know, uh, my first reaction is, mm, you know, sounds like the internet to me. But really, mm. it, 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 it possibly does shed a little bit of light on why sometimes I'll search for something on Wikipedia and I'll be like, huh, there's not really any information on this particular subject. I would have thought there would be. And then maybe there's a lot of information on something else. Well, if you have almost, almost entirely one gender uh, deciding what gets fleshed out as far as you know, fact on a particular yeah. topic, that might account for something. So I don't know, Amber, what do you think? I, I sort of wonder, Wikipedia has been such a great tool for me uh, over time, but I'm constantly having to remind myself if I ever see something there and I want to, you know, maybe copy and paste it somewhere because I'm, you know, looking for facts, I have to remember that, you know, Wikipedia is, anybody can write anything on Wikipedia and you sort of assume that somebody's checking, fact checking, but that's not necessarily happening and it, it can't be considered as completely true just because it's there. Yeah, it's interesting in this article where they talk about, uh, I think it was a grad student who mentions that uh, from 2007 until now, they described this phase as a declining phase of Wikipedia. And Sarah, I wonder if, because there are so many organizations, so whether it's a, a city or an individual who now have a stronger presence online, that Wikipedia isn't necessarily needed as much anymore. You know, Wikipedia to me seemed great when I wanted to go out and find out something about a, a a certain person and maybe their website wasn't up to date or accurate but it just seems like there is there are plenty of other places to go to get that type of content that could essentially be more reliable so i do find myself going to wikipedia less than i did before because of that exact issue as far as being able to trust the information i mean i know even on my own bio on wikipedia there are a bunch of things that are just random and, and some of them are just plain old mistakes so i just yeah. feel like it's not accurate well, and yeah. I think we all know that, but yeah, or yeah, it, it, and you know, my Wikipedia article as well. It's like, I think it's all accurate. I don't know. I haven't looked at it really closely in a while, but it is random. It's like the stuff that people choose to. It, you know, it's like I don't know. That doesn't seem like a highlight of my career, but whatever. There's just it's just kind of you know what's it's just stuff that's in there. Um, gosh, every once in a while, someone will be like, "Interesting Wikipedia article," and I'm like, "Ugh, gosh, I forgot about that." You're like, Privacy please really don't dead. go there. Please don't go there. I know for the longest time, and I don't know if my entry says this anymore, but for the longest time, it said that I collected wristwatches. <laughs> it was so random. And I mean, it's not true. I've had the same watch on for 12 years. That's so weird. It's sort of like, it's like an, some sort of like a weird amber Wikipedia Easter egg where someone was just waiting <laughs> to be called out on that. Does it still say it? Uh, it says, yeah, it, it talks about my interests. And then it said, I think in the top that uh, I also liked collecting wristwatches. And it, it kept getting deleted and then added back in. And it was just the most bizarre thing in the world. I could never understand why that it said that. I guess it doesn't say it anymore, but just really bizarre things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me when you talk about the, it, Wikipedia being a service where there are more than 90% men are the ones who are updating it and editing it. And uh, hence for me personally, the, the wristwatch joke. Very strange. Very strange. Maybe Leo, Leo said that once or yeah, who knows? 
It's yeah. all it takes, right? It's just one comment from it could be five or 10 years ago yep. and then it gets added in there. So yep. it'll be interesting to see the future of Wikipedia if it, it, it's still around and still useful. But uh, I, I suspect it will continue to dwindle. Yeah, because I, I think it's especially when you're asking people to participate in something that requires a lot of upkeep. I mean, if you're going to be mm -hmm. a Wikipedia editor, people are going in and changing things all the time. I, I do not do this anymore, but I mean, I have changed my own Wikipedia entry just for clarity. It's not like I've ever put anything in there that isn't true. And I've had people call me out right away and be like, we know that's you and you can't do that. And I was like, oh my goodness, okay. They're watching. But and what happens, Sarah, too, sorry to interrupt you, but what happens too, because Google is almost replacing the need for Wikipedia as far as people who are living in the sense that if you have a Google Plus profile, all that information is coming up and the results, right? So you don't you don't need to rely on it necessarily as much. And I think Google's kind of changing the way people get information about individuals if they're part of that uh um, if they're part of the Google Plus uh, platform. Yeah, that's true too. That's actually very true. And then, you know, that's, that allows you to have more control over the kind of information as well. So, yeah. Hey, look, we just got, people that search oh, for you also search for me. I know. Look at us there. We're All relevant. My brother, Leo, Andy Walker, Patrick Norton. Um, <laughs> just had a tweet come in, Sarah, from a guy named uh, Jared. He said, uh, I mentioned on Twitter, you know, is Wikipedia dwindling? And he says, definitely check out at uh, uh, Hafix Doctor at Work. It's all about figuring out why this is happening to Wikipedia right now. So uh, anyway, interesting uh, bit of feedback. And uh, something else from Tracy Jordan, who says people use it every day, don't they? Is, the is it the decline in traffic or content updates? So uh, obviously people interested in the conversation around Wikipedia. Yeah, and, and as far as technology reviews uh, numbers, the, the, the people visiting just the English language version of Wikipedia is, I mean, it's huge. They're getting crazy traffic. It's all about the people that are working behind the scenes that uh, that seems to be slowing down. And then it just kind of turns into like a, well, so then does Wikipedia just become something that nobody trusts as sort of the end all be all for information? Does it have to change into some sort of a model where, well, no, you start paying people to work there and then they have a job to do and they can't just kind of let things hang or, or, or or have a whole subset of information that nobody really cares about so it never gets updated. I don't know, uh, it, but but it'll be interesting to see if the decline continues, you know, what we're talking about uh, a year from now as mm -hmm. it relates to Wikipedia. Definitely. All right, well, we mentioned uh, there are some really great articles, obviously, to catch up on, whether they're medium blog posts or the history of Wikipedia or uh, some fun Instagram stuff. Uh, quick reminder that you can always go to twit.tv slash TSH to find not only all of the shows that you may have missed, maybe you missed a week here or there, but also all of the links to the articles that Amber and I talk about. We've got our little rundown here and we basically just sort of copy and paste it onto our each sh sh uh, episode page and that way you can keep up with us. So never fear if you're like in your car listening to us and you think, oh, well, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's serious. So Amber was out last week. And by the way, Amber, welcome back. And I'm Thank glad that you. you're feeling better. Uh, then yeah, look, Ayaz and I were just not having it last week, apparently. That is a great screenshot, though. I don't know what we were doing. Yeah, good times. But yeah, that's uh, where all of our links are. And of course, if you are watching us live or listening to us, uh, we are live on Fridays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. If you want to join us, uh, where you can get sort of the unedited version of the show. Otherwise, of course, we're on demand. We know that's how uh, the bulk of you get our programming. And thanks to everybody who watches and listens each week. Okay, before we move on to some social tips and spotlights, we should take a moment to thank lynda.com for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. If you're watching our show, uh, you're probably interested in social media, right? You want to keep up on the latest and the greatest. You're interested in perhaps learning uh, what new programs and services and tools are at your disposal. You want to get involved, but you know it can be a little overwhelming. With a lynda.com subscription, that's L-Y-N-D-A dot com, you can learn creative software business skills 
That way you can achieve personal goals or professional goals. Maybe this is something that you know you can leverage at work or just something that you've been really interested in. Uh, members receive unlimited access to a big, big library of high quality, current, and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects, which is kind of funny, Amber. You know, you and I are talking about the importance of videos. Many times, especially when it comes to social, you, you learn by watching somebody else do it. And these yeah, videos are high quality. It's, it's something that you can follow along with in the comfort of your own home or wherever you'd like your office to be at the time. Uh, that's, you know, it's sometimes that's the, absolutely the best way to get a walkthrough of something. I mean, imagine having to try to teach yourself Photoshop, but not actually looking at somebody showing you the steps in using that program. It'd be a lot, it'd be a lot more uh, complicated. With a subscription, you can create a blog using WordPress, share your content. Maybe you're like, nah, I've never gotten into WordPress. That's something that lynda.com would be great for. Take better photos with your social media posts. Hey, you wanna be like the next Instagram star? A lot of it has less to do with filters and more to do with being a good photographer. You can market your product or your website, uh, learn how SEO can help you, advertise using Google AdWords. This is all stuff that a social media quote ninja would know about. Use Google Analytics, Microsoft Excel to create things like pivot tables and analyze data. There's all sorts of stuff that you can learn at lynda.com. Over 2,000 courses, in fact, and new courses are added every day. In fact, new courses added this week include OS X Mavericks Essentials. Mavericks, of course, is Apple's latest desktop OS that was pushed out for free to all users. Well, to people who are eligible, which is basically if you have a Mac that's you bought anywhere in the last six years. So that's a lot of people. Lighting for video production is another class that's new. Management tips. The fundamentals of content marketing. That could be all stuff where hey, maybe you're an expert already, but chances are you could always learn a thing or two, feel like you're, feel like you're up to date. And uh, curated course content. Each lynda.com course is really, really structured. As a user, you learn from start to finish, or you can jump around. Maybe there's just, it's just part of this Mavericks tutorial that you're really interested in and the rest of the stuff you've kind of got, or you want to you wanna come back to it, that sort of thing. It is 25 bucks a month for access to Linda's entire course library, or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan. That includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the same exact assets. But we want you to check it out. Have a free seven-day trial. Just see what you can learn with Linda. Visit lynda.com slash social hour. And you've got access to the entire library. Over 2,000 courses, all for free for seven days. Go nuts and tell us what you think. That's lynda.com slash social hour. And we thank Linda for their support of our show. Hey, Sarah, this is kind of a, a cool bit of feedback because I know yeah. Laura is watching the show. She says, uh, congrats, on the, congrats on the Linda spot. I taught myself in design this year with it and convinced my boss to get five licenses for our staff. Oh, that's so, great. Uh, and someone else has favorited uh, the tweet as well. So it looks like we already have quite a few people who probably use Linda who are listening to the show. So it's a great deal for them to be able to uh, save on a subscription. Yes, that's, that's awesome. Seven days free. Go nuts. Learn something. I mean, I, I could use those Photoshop tips, that's for sure. <laughs> Me too. It's just one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not just going to magically learn, you, you know, take, take a nice course. All right, let's move on to, we've got, uh, this is actually a great tip. If you are an iOS user, I am. If you are an iOS user and you use the native mail application, which I sometimes do, although I actually like the third-party mail app Mailbox better. LinkedIn has a new offering that is perfect for you. It's called LinkedIn Intro. And what it does is it actually is, it's sort of an attachment, an add-on to the native mail app in iOS so that when somebody emails you, it will hook up to that person's LinkedIn profile assuming that they have one, but let's say that they do, you would see not only their LinkedIn photograph, uh, that's, it, that, would be, that would be part of the email, so you've got sort of a nice visual indicator of who's emailing you, but then also 
you can expand to see where they you know work as a, as a job um, stuff that that friends that you have in common really really pretty much anything that you would get from looking at someone's LinkedIn profile all of a sudden becomes part of your iOS experience when you're emailing now Amber I don't know this this has gotten a lot of attention and some security experts say ah, this is you know, not really a good idea the way that LinkedIn uh, mm basically links into the mail app. But that aside for a second, just as a concept, I like this idea. I think it's great, but it does tend to put a professional spin on a lot of the email I get. And I mean, not everybody that I'm friends with, I care at all about their LinkedIn. You know, it, they're not all work um, associates or people yeah. that I've met through work. I, I like I, mean, I like the idea. I mean, it reminds me a lot of, uh, I think it's Zobni, which I think we've yes. talked about on the show before, where it just adds context to the people who are emailing you. Now, the interesting thing I think about Zobni is I believe that they do not just LinkedIn, but also Twitter and Facebook. So it opens it up to a more social audience. But I do think this is a move in the right direction. I think more and more LinkedIn has to kind of reinvent itself um, to do more than just allow you to search for people because I, I haven't found it that effective as far as business and business leads. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't either. I also, if there's a, I don't even know what photo of mine is on LinkedIn, but it's like, that's just one more thing that I have to keep track of and assume <laughs> that that's the picture that someone's going to be seeing front and center uh, on their iOS device every time I email them. It's like, it, it's it's actually kind of genius because it, it it's going, oh, okay. So, yeah, it's, that's sort of an old picture of me. I guess I, you know, I don't know. I should think about that. But uh, it, it, it assumes that we really use LinkedIn perhaps more than we do. I, yeah. I don't, I, it's, I, it's, I've got a profile, it's there, it's not going anywhere, but I don't know that I need it to be part of my everyday emailing experience, even though the context is good. But it's still not, I still haven't found it to be overly useful. I mean, I'm glad that, that I have it, but I think it's it's one of those things where I think if they, they reinvent things and they come out with new integration and apps and those type of things, then all of a sudden it starts to make a little bit more sense. But yeah. uh, other than that, I just, I don't find it great. I mean, I've emailed people on there before to try to get in touch with people. I usually never hear back. Yeah. So I find so, sometimes just going and, and trying to find someone's email is just a better route. Even Twitter I've found, I've found has been better. So um that would be kind of my take on it, but it's it's an interesting move for them. Yeah, I I, I think my main issue with LinkedIn is, or it's not an issue, but just the reason that I don't open it up daily. I mean, I'm I'm not even on LinkedIn once a week. I I, oh, me I either. yeah, I mean it's it's probably more like once a month, if that. I think it's because let's say on Facebook. Okay, so for example, I met a friend of a friend last night. We all went to this music show together. I'd never met him before. And today I got a friend request on Facebook from him. And I was like, oh yeah, that guy's really nice. Friend, okay, we're friends now. I mean, I met you once for two hours. On LinkedIn, if he would have wanted to add me as a contact, if, if we're not in the same industry, then that seems very odd to me. Because yeah. it's like, I mean, what? how can I help you with a job or you know that sort of thing? So it does seem limiting. And that's why when you bring it into the social aspect of emailing people, it can kind of skew how you uh, you know, are, are categorizing somebody as your friend. It seems dull too. I mean, in some ways, when we have all of the these great social networks with interesting content, you go into LinkedIn, there's just, I mean, there's not much to do there, right? <laughs> I think that's part of it as well. Yeah. So uh, I tend to not use it a lot. And uh, I think it, you know, it's competing out there with all the new social networks and apps that allow people to, to keep in touch. And uh, some of those things are just getting better and better all the time. Uh, one thing that we want to talk about next up for our social tip is just how Vine video has changed and how it's becoming even easier to use with two new updates in uh, the most recent release. They have something that uh, is called sessions. They also have something called uh, time travel. And uh, these features allow you to do interesting things. Sessions allowing you to save drafts of un finished posts. So you can come back to them later. You can do up to 10 at a time, according to this Mashable article. And then time travel is kind of neat too, Sarah. It uh, allows you to do uh, things like reorganize and replace shots and just allows you to further edit those videos on Vine. It's great. I uh, Somebody on Twitter, it's I don't remember who it was um, when this feature came out. I think it was yesterday, said something like, okay, so I guess we call editing time traveling and you know and and sessions are like drafts 
okay, Vine is just calling it, making it sound a lot more exciting. But that's pretty much exactly <laughs> what it is. But no, this is good. This is, Vine is clearly here to stay. Amber, you and I have, uh, we've, we've, we've tried to figure out why it's so popular and it just keeps getting more and more interesting as people use this short video medium for not only just really creative stuff, we've seen advertisers get into the mix now. So I think this is just the next logical step, is the, the Vine app is that much easier to, to, to be able to put something that you're proud enough to post. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, I'm kind of impressed on the marketing side and social media marketing, how some companies are using Vine. I think there's a lot of creativity there. But uh, other than that, I haven't used it a lot in my uh, daily life. But uh, hey, there's always time, Sarah. There is. Eventually. There is. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. Um, I sometimes I sometimes end up uh, on Vine for quite a while watching. It's poke, poking around. Yeah, poking around, watching looped videos over and over. It does happen. It does. Oh, uh, so that's Vine's time travel and sessions. Uh, it's a uh, new features. Uh, it's uh, available to anybody, whether you're a lurker or you want to create your own stuff. You now have more options. It's not unlike what Instagram has added. Uh, when you you know you take a video, um, you can go backwards. But Vine has taken it a step further, where you can actually start rearranging stuff. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's move on to our first of a couple spotlights. This one is uh, a Tumblr account. It's new to me. I haven't heard of it. Okay, so I just found this today. It's called How May We Hate You, and it's from uh, uh, two guys who work in the hotel industry. They're both concierges at uh, hotels in uh, New York City, and they decided to create a Tumblr blog because I don't, I didn't know this, but over 39 million people or tourists flock to Times Square every year. Pretty crazy. And I guess they get frustrated sometimes with some of the comments and questions from people who are visiting their hotels, and they decided to post and create a Tumblr blog to talk Talk about it. Now, uh, on this Mashable article, the first entry is uh, kind of the most interesting. I don't know if you read this one, Sarah, but it's uh, when a guest needed a salon appointment. This is one of the exchanges that they talk about. The guest says, I need a salon appointment, wash and blow on Saturday at 12. Concierge says, all right, you are confirmed for a wash and blow at the salon at noon on Saturday. And the guest rolls her eyes. And he says, the concierge says, is that all right? And the guest says, well, I'm just very dubious about the quality of a salon that actually has space at 12 on a Saturday. Is there another one you could recommend? And the concierge says, you want me to recommend a salon that won't have space at the time you're requesting? And the guest says, yeah, let's try that. <laughs> Which is funny because it's like, like, the part of me totally understands what she means, <laughs> but it is absolutely ridiculous as a concierge. You must get stuff like that all the time where it's just like, oh, yeah. oh face plant. It is so funny. And uh, there are a bunch of other entries that they've written about. So I, I thought it was kind of funny that, you know, they called it How May We Hate You, just like How May We Help You, of course, and uh, funny exchanges that they have to deal with on a regular basis. So it's a good it's a good thing, you know, for people to have a place where they can vent, because I'm sure for many people, their jobs are very frustrating. Absolutely. And it's good to, you know, have a creative outlet and Tumblr is the perfect place for this. Perfect place. Tumblr is great for this sort of stuff. There's a Tumblr account that I've been following for years. It's called Clients from Hell. And <laughs> it's all about, uh, it's it, it's not really clear if this is just like one guy who, you know, is is always dealing with clients and it, or, or if this is like a bunch of people. I think it's probably a, a bunch of people who, you know, maybe write in with stuff, but it's all these little interactions with freelancers and clients so who hilarious. ask horrible things of them. Them, you know, or or go on and on about something that, as a designer, you know is irrelevant, and it's it's kind of hysterical because the situations are always like, oh, really awful, but in this, at the same time, pretty familiar to all of us who know that just sometimes clients can be from hell. Yes, and frustrating. And frustrating. So we have. We have another spotlight. This is About.me collections, and I have not seen this yet online. Yeah, this is actually really cool. So About.me is, it's it's not unlike a uh, Google profile uh, that that you would have on yourself. It's a, I have one. I'm sure you do as well, Amber. Um, About.me slash Sarah Lane or slash whoever is supposed to be a landing page that's all about you. You know, you put up, up a nice high quality photo of yourself. You've got a little blurb about who you are and what you do. You can add links to various places that you're active online, a lot of social in, uh, integration there. Um, and in fact, for a long time, I've thought, well, why, why don't I just have saralane.com forward to my about.me page? Because it's like, if you want to start there, 
I, I mean, mm -hmm. you can get to literally everywhere that I frequent from this page if you want to. And it's, you know, it's kind of nice and simplified. So yeah. what, what uh, uh, About.me has decided to do is introduce something called collections. So you've got a, you've got a, an about.me page for yourself, right? And when you're when you're using the site, you know, you you, you log in and you can obviously uh, uh, make edits to your own about.me page. But now you can start collecting other folks pages and and it's not just sort of like, oh, I need to remember this particular person, but there may be something on someone's profile that you end up later saying, oh gosh, what, where was that? How did I get yeah. to that one website or that one blog post or whatever? This is a way for you to basically, it's, I think the company calls it Pinterest for your friends. Um, huh. But you're kind of bookmarking other people's profiles and being able to organize them into your own collections, kind of just for you, but it also displays nicely. That's kind of cool, yeah. actually. I like that. And you know what? It's so funny. Every time I see an about.me page, I, I'm reminded of what a cool service it is and what a great simplified way to get your information online. And so I have to tell you that I absolutely love your picture on the about.me page. So oh, for people you. who are listening to audio, you need to check it out because it's Sarah sitting in front of the uh, uh, giant twit sign and it's very cute. But uh, it's, a, it's a great little tool, a great way to get a uh, you know one page up quickly as you develop your own site. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's. I think it's probably the easiest way to just have like a here's all the things that you would ever need to know about me type of a page. Throw it up there. Um, it's completely free. It's interesting. About taught me before it officially launched was bought by AOL. It was one of those companies where it's like, whoa, AOL bought it before it was even really a public company. Um, and then recently, it sort of went back to the private model. It sort of extracted. I think it's just a pretty small team. I think there's about five people who work there. Extracted itself from AOL and is now uh, an indie company uh, startup again. So it's interesting to see the the team iterate and and you know kind of experiment with something beyond just a oh it's a it's an about me page. Uh, they're they're doing other stuff and making it worth our while to hang out there more and then obviously yeah. discover new profiles, which is you know good for everybody. Yeah, that's very cool. I like it. Yeah. So that is about.me collections. All right, before we get into some of your feedback and some cool videos and, and tweets of the week, let's take a moment to thank Squarespace. They're our second sponsor of this episode of The Social Hour. You know Squarespace. They're, they, but they're, we're, we're like BFFs here of Squarespace and The Social Hour. Uh, it's an all-in-one platform that makes it as easy as possible to create your own professional website, portfolio, or online store. Yeah, so let's say... Let's say that you, you know, you've got your about.me page, you're pretty happy with it, but it's like, well, you want to link it actually to your great photography blog or maybe the place where you sell, you know, these awesome t-shirts that you had made or maybe just where you write long think pieces because that's, you know, you're, you're still a fan of the written word or some sort of a combination of all three. No matter what you want to have as your website, Squarespace is your platform. New features, new designs, better support than ever because it really is an all-in-one solution. It's not, it's not just about the publishing, it's about the back end too. It's about, it's about the hosting and, and the support as well. The designs alone are just unparalleled. They're beautiful. They really are, yeah. I mean, more than 20 uh, new, new template designs that you may not have even seen if you haven't sort of browsed their de their template design uh, recently. It's definitely worth going back over there and seeing what some of your options are just right out of the gate. Uh, in fact, Squarespace is like the design award king. They've won Webby's and Forbes awards and, and FWA awards. Easy to use, I can tell you that right now. Um, I've been using Squarespace for years and you know, anytime I've, I've ever run into a question, a uh, little, little question over to the customer service team. They respond to me quickly. They're 24-7 service. So you never really have to worry about feeling like you're, uh, like you're lost out there. But it really is easy to use. And it's not expensive. For an all-in-one solution, starts at $8 a month. Includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. So 
it, it not only is, is, is affordable, but it's just really convenient to have all of that in the same place. And then it's mobile optimized. In this day and age, you can't have a website that just looks awesome on, you know, some sort of a desktop browser and nowhere else. That just doesn't work anymore. You got to have mobile optimized and Squarespace does that beautifully. Uh, and, and, and I mentioned, you know, selling t-shirts. It's commerce ready. Squarespace provides a really powerful, flexible e-commerce solution. This is actually working with every Squarespace template. You don't have to like pick a special one. It allows sales for physical and digital goods. So let's say you're selling you know, your MP3s uh, or your books or your t-shirts or whatever. Single interface for order management. You can track orders. You've got customizable uh, customer email updates. You can print shipping labels, add coupons. It's crazy. Global reach for your online store as a Squarespace commerce is available in uh, 10 countries, uh, but chances are it's one of yours, uh, US, UK, Canada being uh, just a few of them. So let's, let's start you out with a trial, free trial. Just check out Squarespace. Don't need a credit card. Start building your website. When you decide to sign up, use the offer code SOCIALHOUR10. That's social hour and then the number 10, and you get 10% off to show your support for us. We want you to have a little gift. And we thank Squarespace for their support of the social hour. Beautiful templates. Really, uh, they're awesome. Really I just recommended Squarespace to someone, I think it was last week, but someone who didn't have any designer development skills, but had uh, a, a quick download to be able to turn around a website and wanted to be able to do something that still looked good. So uh, perfect solution if you're in that situation, for sure. Absolutely. So we, uh, we mentioned Laura, uh, who has been uh, extremely helpful to us throughout the show. Uh, right before the show started, she actually tweeted something that's pretty awesome. I just thought it was worth looking at because it is. it's a knit QR code that's knitted into a scarf. Hilarious. Ooh, look at that. I know, the guy driving with the big scarf around him and the QR code. I, I thought this was kind of fun. You know, I don't like QR codes, but when I saw this, I thought, you know what, that is a really clever use of a QR code where I'm not sure anyone would necessarily rely on it on a regular basis, but it definitely is a conversation piece. It really is. The thing, the thing that's funny is like QR codes sometimes, you know, sometimes I roll my eyes a little bit when I see one. Um, I don't know. There's it's like, like you see like a big QR code as a billboard on you know in the city, and you're sort of like, yeah, they all look the same. And or, or sometimes you'll see one somewhere where you think, well, that's a little silly, you know, on a pizza box or whatever. But that takes some skills. I mean, you have to like be a skilled knitter just oh, to yeah. be able to get something like that to show up properly. And of course, with QR codes, if they're done properly, they're easy to scan, and then you get like a message that you can sort of unlock. Uh, via your your smartphone, but it but it but it has to actually be accurate. So kudos to Lisa Bogart, I believe, uh, for, uh, for 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 knitting uh, the first QR code scarf that I've been aware of. Yeah, and it looks like the pattern is available on the site on uh, knitty.com if you want uh, uh, some how-to information about how to knit your own. So we'll put a link to that in our show notes. So if there are knitters out there, you can check it out. And you know what's interesting is there there are always knitters. There's a lot of people who knit. I know Laura knits and uh, it's an amazing skill. So um, if anyone wants to make one of these, let us know, take a picture and uh, send it over to us. Yeah, absolutely. Knitty is, and that's K-N-I-T-T-Y, like knitty. Exactly. Uh, that is not the only knitting social network uh, and there probably are more than two, but there's another one. If somebody can recall, I know Leo and I, I have know. talked about it in the past. Um, on an episode of The Social Hour, I believe, uh, oh, that what was is it uh, called? What's, it's a really it's a it's it's a big one, but anyway, yes, there are for whatever reason the knitting community is really good with social. Well, I guess because yeah. there's a lot of sharing, like hey, try this pattern or what do you think? Here's a picture of something that I've completed. There there is even though it seems like such a solitary activity, it's kind of cool that it becomes something that that uh, that inspires friendships and community. Oh, definitely. Uh, Laura just wrote us back. It's called Ravelry. Ravelry. Dot com. That's so, right. Yeah, I wouldn't it is a that. really cool network. I, it, it's awesome. So uh, thanks for sharing that. We also have another tweet, Sarah. Is this from J, J Rosemont? Is that right? J Rosemont on Twitter. Uh, yes. Uh, is, is, he's not happy with Tweetbot 3. Okay, so let me give you guys a little bit of background. So Tweetbot is a third-party app uh, made by a company called Tapbots. 
um, that uh, is is definitely my my Twitter app of choice. This is not an official Twitter app, so it behaves a little bit differently than the official Twitter app would. However, I've liked it for a long time, and Tweetbot 3 is technically a completely uh, new, ooh, thank you for that, oh, here we go. It, it's a new version of Tweetbot that's completely designed from the ground up. It's supposed to be much more integrated with iOS 7, uh, but it is, it's a standalone app that you download. So if you were already using Tweetbot, you would, you would delete the old app you pay another three dollars, and then you have the new Tweetbot three. So let's just say, you know, I'm I'm such a fan of their products that I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll you know I'll I'll pay the money. Um, let's go back to just looking at my uh, this is my profile. If I'm just looking at my my stream here, what Jay Rosemont is talking about. Let's go up to the top here of my timeline. Is he says. I hate the new verified check mark in Tweetbot 3. It's so obtrusive. What were they thinking? What he's talking about is Twitter verified accounts. So my friend Evelyn is verified, and you can see she's got this little check mark right next to her name. Uh, there are a lot of people who aren't. Let's get another one. Gideon Litchfield here, uh, Billy Eichner, New York Times. Uh, so you can see that there are people who are verified. O'Malik is verified. And then there are people that aren't. But I think uh, uh, our friend Jay Rosemont's issue is that more than ever, it really, really highlights when you're not because you're right next to somebody with a big old check mark next to their name. Now, this is mm. not something that Tweetbot is showing off that isn't publicly available information. On anyone's Twitter profile, you'll see that exact same check mark, whether they're verified or not. But you don't see it in your Twitter stream, so a kind of uh, in your face the way that this is. Amber, does this bother you? Is this something well, that you would even notice? You know, it's really funny because I think it uh, is one of those things that uh, I would probably notice because if you notice the way the design is, Sarah, and I'm not sure they meant it to be like this, but doesn't your eye, isn't it just drawn towards the people who are verified? Yeah. It just, it feels to me like they are just highlighted, even if they didn't make, mean to do that, but they are definitely... Uh, the the visual way they've done it with the uh, check mark, they just kind of stand out uh, versus other people in your stream. So I don't know what you do about this. If you make it smaller, I mean, is that going to solve the problem? Maybe. Or do you even need it at all? I don't know. I mean, I don't really pay attention to people who follow me if they're verified or not. I, I could care less. No, yeah. I, at I, the end of the day. It does not matter to me if someone's verified or not because I know just I know enough about the way that Twitter works is there's really no rhyme or reason to being verified. Well, that's not that's not always true. The idea behind being verified is it's Twitter's way of saying, yes, that really is President Obama, or yes, this person uh, you know, really is who they say they were because maybe there have been impersonation issues with like fake accounts in the past type of a thing. But then you have all these people who are legitimate and have lots of interesting things to say and contribute that aren't verified. And so it's like, okay, well, verification just seems to be something that happens. Why am I verified? I don't know. I mean, who knows who at Twitter decided that I should be. I, I guess I'm glad that I'm Sarah Lane, but uh, you know, I'd know that anyway. I'd still be as, 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 as much of a Twitter user otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's almost like it's rewarding people for what exactly and making other people feel like somehow they need to get a check mark as well because they're somehow less important. Yeah, I mean, the only time I feel as though being verified is useful when I'm searching for other people is if there's someone out there, maybe an author or an actor, and I want to look them up on Twitter, and I want to make sure that it's the right person because there's a lot of people impersonating them. It's very helpful in that sense. So in this case, I can understand the complaint about it being a little bit obnoxious. It feels a, a somewhat out of place, I think, within the app. But uh, I, again, I think they could just, you know, they could have done it just without it, you know, just leave it out entirely. Yeah. I agree. It's a, it would have been okay. The the app in general, um, and this is again, this you know, it's an iOS app, so it, it it may not have anything to do with you. But in general, there are a lot of changes. I mean, when I first opened it, I was like, oh my goodness, because I spend so much time in Tweetbot that it's it's rather jarring um, all of the changes. So a lot of this, I think, is probably that kind of like knee jerk reaction to it looking different and people just not liking change. 
Um, but uh, PC guy in our chat room says there are other things about Tweetbot that people also don't like. It's not just the verified check mark, mm -hmm. and that's true. In fact, I'm starting. I'm you know I've gotten so good at you know swiping left and right to get certain behaviors, and now it doesn't work that way, and I have to relearn things, and that's not exactly my favorite thing, but. But hey, it's one of your options. If you're a Tweetbot lover, you're probably going to end up upgrading to Tweetbot 3 because that's what we do. All right, let's move on to our video of the week. We haven't had one of these in a while. Yeah, so uh, I saw this video probably two days ago, and it was making the rounds from some friends of mine on Facebook. And because I was speaking at an education conference, I showed it to the audience both yesterday and today at the event. And uh, it's it's story, I just kind of kind of set it up because the audio isn't great at the beginning, but uh, it's about a, a kid in the UK who was failing math. And uh, he finally got a passing grade, which was a C. And previously he had had an F. And what he did is he set up a little, almost like a spy cam, while he was explaining to his dad that he had finally reached the C and uh, passed math for the first time. And this is the dad's reaction. This video of cats that look like they're dancing to techno, but in reality, oh. man, it's cool. Oh, I think that's probably not the video. Maybe just a news story about it. But Sorry, um, Amber. I think I brought up the wrong page. Hold on a second. It's OK. No problem. Well, no, the page is right. Is it? I think it. I, I think it's. I don't know. I think that's the news story. Um, I can actually get you the video if you want. If it's <laughs> maybe it switched videos on me here. It, I think. Yeah, I think you were sort of part of a little, like a little slideshow, and it just. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Sorry about. That. I'll uh, tell Jeff to edit. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Right. Sorry, just clicking differently. Yeah? What's happened? I need, I need to come in here. Something happened? Yeah, no, I, 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 I just got something, I just got something from school. I need to come and look at it. Uh, it's really important. <laughs> the suspense is killing me. I know. Why can't we have a minute, mate? Come in. His dad looks at the grade on a piece of paper. He's opening it up right now for our audio listeners. He's looking at it. Here he goes. Is that real? Yeah. Is that real? Yeah. My God! <laughs> 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 Look at the I, so, so obviously it's a good grade. Yeah, it's a passing grade for the first time ever. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I feel like I'm like I'm gonna cry because the dad is so happy. I know. It's like he's the proudest me. dad ever. I showed it off a couple of times and people in the audience were bawling their eyes out, especially because it was a bunch of teachers. So it's very important. So yeah, he he, he had previously only uh, received an F in math. He finally got to C. Like I mentioned, that's a passing grade. And so he shared that with his dad. And, uh, you know, it's funny because at first I thought, oh, I hope this is a real video, kind of the real thing. And I, I went online and did a search and uh, totally the real thing. They were interviewed on a bunch of different news networks and uh, the dad's super happy. Someone on the Today Show asked the dad, what would you do if your son received uh, an A. I mean, how would you react then? And he said, I would probably have a heart attack. <laughs> so, it's very cute. That's it's, it's cute, too, that the son, I guess the dad still doesn't know that he's on camera. No. Or at least not in the video. But, you know, he, the son knows that he's going to get that kind of reaction. And he's like, we're going to tape this uh, because it's going to be awesome. Um, so cute. That's adorable. Oh, my goodness. He's such I a know. happy dad. Yeah, it's well, maybe the son should not strive for an A uh, so dad can stay healthy and not <laughs> have a heart attack. And, I'm with you on that and one. And go nuts. All right, uh, Tweet of the Week. This is a Twitter handle that, Amber, you found called Two Headlines. Yeah, this is just a fun little one. I, I found it on Waxy Links. Doesn't even have a lot of followers right now, but uh, it's at two headlines, like you mentioned. And basically what they do is uh, the person who updates it, he updates it every hour, which is insane. Wow. And he essentially takes two headlines that are in the news and he just mashes them together to create really odd headlines. So this isn't for everyone, but uh, there are definitely some uh, funny headlines on there. 
So, Stream United Airlines album Reflector. So that, okay, so you know what's funny is like, probably because I spend so much time looking at news headlines, this might make more sense to me than to the average person. <laughs> That's a okay. good one. Yep, mm -hmm, yep, I'm into it. Yeah, That's knife wielding woman, 60 fatally shot by Kim Kardashian. Right. So. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's weird, isn't it? It's very strange. There's... And the thing is that he updates, he does update it every single hour. So it's just bizarre. I mean, it's like I said, it's not for everyone, but for the right person, you'd have fun digging around and trying to figure out, you know, which headlines they are. And it, it, it feels a little puzzle like almost. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. What was that? Edmonton Oilers posts higher Q3 profits. Uh, or profit. So uh, that's a hockey team, obviously, part of the NHL. But, uh, you know, just it's so random. How does this guy think of this stuff? I don't it's know. Bizarre. Good question. There's a, there's a place for everyone online, Sarah. That's basically what this boils down to. You know, since we are talking about, yes, uh, the awesomeness of Twitter and the weirdness and just the fact that somebody is like putting so much effort into, I, I don't know, maybe, you, maybe it doesn't take that much time, but it's like to tweet on the hour. It, it, that's just it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, even if you're using some sort of a service where you could schedule out posts like something like Buffer, that's still it's just a lot of content. Um, you know, another uh, uh, Twitter account that I really recently fell in love with is called Combined History. So it's at Combined History um, on Twitter, and what it does is it mashes up. Um, you can look at my screen if you need to, Brian. It mashes up a a, a current photo in a, an exact location with a a photo from, you know, the past in that exact location. So the photo that we're looking at right now uh, and the Twitter the Twitter um, uh, description will tell you where, well, actually it doesn't tell you where that one was. I have no idea. But like, look at this one for San Francisco. So that's 1906, 2006. Um, sort of, you know, I mean, quite a bit different. But then there's a really cool, like this is, um, you know, a picture of the Eiffel Tower in current day, but at one point, uh, you know, well, you know who, and and his friends posing for a photo in front of there, but you know, the exact same spot. It's really interesting. It's not so much about Twitter, it's about cool photos, yeah. but um, but I love it. It's very cool. Very yeah, cool. no, there's so, so many interesting things like this online that are, it's like the fringes of the internet, right, Sarah? And uh, I think when you can dive in there, and that's why I love Waxy Links, and I know we've talked about it before, but you're able to find those things that you don't see on Mashable or any other mainstream spots because there are these these weird little corners that it's, are sometimes it's, fun to explore. It's great, yes. That's the wonderful thing about the social hour is we're like, and here's the show where it's all appropriate to talk about. Hurrah! We're doing it right. Uh, we do love hearing from you, by the way, because so much of the cool stuff that we find comes from... Uh, recommendations from the audience and our community. We love hearing from you, whether you're tweeting at us. Amber and I have gotten pretty good at being able to read your tweets in real time. For anybody who's watching a live show, that's a lot of fun. But of course, you can write us at thesocialhour at twit.tv. You can leave us a voicemail. 2626social is our Google Voice mailbox. You can record a video, upload it somewhere, send us the link. All sorts of ways that you can uh, tell us about an interesting service, a cool Twitter account, something happening over at Facebook that concerns you, some 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 uh, headline that you think would just be perfect for for us to talk about and and get involved with. Whatever it is, uh, we thank you in advance for helping us make a good show every week. All right, Amber. Before we get to your rad or fad, let's take a moment to thank SAP for sponsoring this episode of the Social Hour. SAP makes the perfect, the perfect solution for anybody working in enterprise on social media. It's called Social Media Solutions, which is a very, very descriptive name actually for what it does. It helps companies use social media to improve their customer service and their support processes because yeah, okay. So you're sitting around, you're like, okay, I'm, 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 I have to be on top of uh, how we outreach to our customers for our product. I'm on the social media team. I have to make sure I know when people are talking about us. I want to know when people are talking about our competitors. I want to know when somebody has some sort of a support issue so that I can reach out. We want to be, we, we want to have that front facing, helpful team that's on top of it. You want to be the company that people says, you know who really does this well? That company, the social, they, they solved my problems. They, 
they, they took it up a notch, right? So you've got the listening component and the engaging component. The listening component is how you ingest all of that information. Somebody writes a review about your product on some sort of review site. Maybe they're angry and they've taken to Twitter. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's their personal blog. Wherever it is, you get all of the information organized systematically bringing in from all the corners of the internet by keyword, by emotion, all sorts of stuff. You know, again, I mentioned your competitors. You can keep up on that. Then the engaging component helps you improve your customer service because now you have all this information and now how are you going to reach back out to your customers? You can drive sales by helping somebody, maybe they're, they're poised to buy, but they have some sort of a question. You answer that question and now you've made a sale. You can quickly solve customer problems. You can turn an angry customer into someone who says, wow, that company seriously solved my problem. They were on top of it. They got back to me in like five minutes. I love this company. And just rapidly responding to customer feedback uh, makes, makes you as a company look like you're on top of it. You understand social. So many companies don't understand social. You definitely want to be on top of it. And if you work at a large enterprise, you know that this is just something that can be really hard to stay on top of. You, you can sort of feel buried by trying to reach out to everybody and, 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 and how do you do that and, and feel like you're being efficient. That is where Social Media Solutions from SAP comes in, gives you more than marketing by improving the customer service and the support experience. If you're interested, you think your company could benefit, go to sap.com slash twit. You can take a guided tour, find out a lot more about specifically what SAP has built, how you can incorporate it into your social media offerings as the enterprise. See for yourself how social media solutions from SAP works. All right, Amber, what is on deck for Rad or Fad this week? Okay, uh, this is kind of neat. I'm not sure uh, where it falls on the rad or fad spectrum, Sarah, but uh, this is something that was created by uh, a bunch of inventors, and uh, it's a, a dock that turns your iPhone into a bedside lamp, okay? Uh, it uses the, uh, uh, the flash light uh, functionality on your iPhone and uh, basically adds a little shade and uh, turns it into a lamp that you can use in your bedroom. It's using suction cups, a bunch of other things. And uh, I don't know, would you ever want something like this, Sarah? I mean, is it really that hard to get an actual lamp? I mean, lamps aren't even that expensive. <laughs> this, is where I, I, this is what I can't understand. Oh, God. Well, I think it's... I mean, I guess you could say there are certain, I don't know, small bedrooms or limited nightstand uh, uh, desk area that it would be good to have an all-in-one solution. Hmm. I, it's probably less of a space issue and more of a, if your iPhone, if your iPhone, if your smartphone is next to you anyway, and yeah. mine always is. I mean, it's, it's my alarm clock. It's, you know, it's the last thing I touch before I go to sleep and the first thing I, you know, touch when I wake up. Um, then maybe it's like, well, why not just make it a lamp? But if it's a, if it has to be one or the other, then that's kind of limiting too. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's just one of these things that someone built that maybe doesn't really solve a problem. I don't think so. Exactly. I don't think there is a problem. I think there, you know, there's nothing wrong with lamps. You can buy a decent lamp for, you know, $10, $15 if you go to Ikea or somewhere. So in this case, I think this is a bit of a fad because I'm, I'm just not sure, you know, as much as I think it's a creative to think about it like that, I'm just not sure that uh, anyone really wants to do this. And then you got to have your charger there and plug it in. And I realize this is a makeshift project, but nonetheless, I don't think, I don't think we need this, Sarah. I think this can, you know, this can be a one-off experiment and hopefully it never sees the light of day as far as manufacturing. Agreed. Yeah. iPhone lamp. I just don't think that Bad. we need it. Don't, Bad. Don't think we need it. Yeah. You know, uh, on the subject of iPhones and light, I have to say that uh, the flashlight app which is mm -hmm. built into, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's part of iOS and easier than ever if I can uh, use my uh, fingerprint to, um, to, to open this up here. Easier than ever to uh, quickly turn on. See, there's my little flashlight yeah. here. Yeah, turn it on and off. Uh, last night when I was at my little fun music show, um, I was trying to take slow-mo videos of a woman dancing in a 
very specific kind of a way. You could say she was twerking, uh-huh. and it was very dark, and so there was flashlight. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, I just thought of this as a example of when an iPhone and a lamp did work well in conjunction. <laughs> But it wasn't you, on a nightstand. <laughs> when you're trying to shoot video of someone in a bar twerking. I mean, it's just like going to bed, Sarah. Really. <laughs> right. That's what it's like in my bedroom. People twerking, dancing. <laughs> exactly. You just need it. Just comes up. But yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's, it's pretty a fad. Common. I think it's a fad. If anybody is like, no, this is the best idea ever, let us know. Let us know why we're not seeing the brilliance of, of, the, uh, of the whole uh, iPhone lamp dock. But I, I go with you. I think it's fad. It's a bit of a fad. Um, and also let us know if you have a router fad you want us to review. You know how to reach us. You can get in touch with, with, touch with us on Twitter, of course. You can also email us and uh, let us know because we are okay including your stuff in the router fad segment too and in any other part of the show. Absolutely. All right. Well, that is it for this episode of The Social Hour. Reminder that we're live on Fridays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. We, uh, we, we do this show live right after This Week in Law, which is right after Tech News Today. It's a wonderful, wonderful Friday programming lineup. And, of course, our website is twit.tv slash T-S-H. That's where you can go to catch up on all things social with Amber and me. Amber, you have anything crazy fun coming up in the next week before we do this show again? Uh, I'm kind of in the midst of a bunch of speaking events. So it's a lot of travel for me. I'm heading out to Vancouver next week and I've been traveling the past couple of days. So this weekend, I really just want to lay low, Sarah, kind of get caught up on emails and relax. What about you? I think I will do the same. I, uh, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to participate in Halloween next week. Ah, of course. Yeah, which would be the day before we do this show. So it's not like, isn't that right? It's uh, Yeah, it's Thursday. Yeah, it's, it's next Thursday. And so, you know, I don't know. Got to get, get work on Friday morning, so it's not like I have a crazy Thursday night or anything, but uh, we'll see. Maybe, maybe um, I'll still be wearing my costume on next Friday. That would be pretty cool. That, so, oh, did you decide what you're going to be or are you not telling anyone? I can't remember. Well, I don't. I have an idea of how I want to dress up, but I don't want to say it because I think it's really good and I'm afraid people will steal it. Ah, <laughs> smart. I just want it all for myself and I probably won't even do it. So it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, who knows? Who knows? Anything can happen. <laughs> Anything can happen in the next seven days. All right, Amber, well, this was a wonderful show as always. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. Until next time, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur, and we will see you soon. Goodbye.